Praise the Lord. Hello, family of God. We are family. We have the same father. Different mothers. Please turn in your Bible to the book of John, chapter 21. Weil Afrikaans kan praten als Johannes 21, met hem Deutsch reden. Wo sind meine, meine Kollegen, der Matthäus, Matthäus, wo bist du? Bist du da? Nein, du bist nach heute, heute Abend nicht da. Das tut mir leid. My German friend from Matthäus, Matthäus, not here tonight. In Afrikaans mensen, kan jullie zeggen Amen? Wow, so viel. Wonderful. That's how you'll all talk when you go to heaven. All right. John chapter 21. John wrote his book, or this book, quite late in life. He was about 18 or 19 when he met Jesus. But he wrote this much late in life, in the, supposedly from the island of Patmos, where he was in, incarcerated on the island. And he had, obviously had servants and people working for him, and people helped him to write. But in the book of John 21, we read about the time Jesus was on the earth for 40 days. And it's always fascinated me. I wish I understood why he was, rose from the dead. And for 40 days he drifted or was around there somewhere. No one knows where he slept, what he did. He saw, 500 people saw him. We have a few bits of information of what he did in those 40 days and nights. But I'm trying to understand why he even hung around. And uh, he said he would not leave us alone. He would send the Holy Spirit, which he did. Ten days later, the Holy Ghost came on Shaviot, the Jewish feast of, of, of the Pentateuch. And so that's Moses' books. And uh, that 40 days, interesting things happened. And one of the things that happened was he went to Galilee. And he found his disciples in a fishing boat. And I find that very unusual for me when I look at Peter's life. And he, he was a fascinating man. I want you to look through his eyes this evening and understand how his life was. He was in a small village of Capernaum. There was a bigger, bigger village or cities around. Uh, Tiberias for sure was bigger, although Jesus never went to Tiberias because it was built on graves. And Herod of Tiberias in his time of Jesus was very offensive because he built his palace in Tiberias on the graves and it made the Jews very angry. However, there was another town which was called, of course, Magdala, which was much bigger and older and had, had fishing, a lot of fishing and wars had been historically so much going on there. And then Capernaum was a quiet um, borderline city which people would go through up and down. It was perfect for the ministry of Jesus to get the information newspaper-wise throughout the whole region. People came from the north, they'd spend the night in, in Capernaum and carry the information of his ministry all throughout, the, all throughout the nation. And so Peter came from this Capernaum, which was on the water's edge. He had a brother and his dad was a successful fisherman. They had a good life. But he himself had so many struggles like many of us in our lives. He he had a lot of insecurity. He was not the firstborn. He was married and he, his brother was very zealous for God. And there was a revivalist evangelist called John. John the Baptist, they call him. He was preaching revival and preaching, get baptized, turn your life around. Baptism is not a Christian thing. It's a very Jewish thing to do. It is a indication, indication of purification, of change. That's what it really symbolizes. So John did that very specifically. And when people repented, he was, he was there, a forerunner to make them aware of God so that they had an opportunity to recognize Christ as the Messiah. Because he came with such a different message that even John himself was confused at the end of his ministry. He sent word from the prison and asked, are you the one or should we expect someone else? He was confused because the message was so wonderfully different. This new gospel, this come to me, all you that are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. What a wonderful gospel. Hebrews tells us if we neglect such a gospel, how shall we ever escape? Such a wonderful message. A wonderful amen would have been good right there. Okay, good. Let's move on. <laughs> So this Peter from this village, he had followed his brother Andrew to this revivalist. And there, when he was at the revivalist, he heard about this Jesus who was doing miracles. It wasn't a common occurrence to have 
people getting healed. One healing is one thing, but consistent healings and miracles will get your attention. And they got their attention. And so Andrew went to go check it out. And Jesus said, go find your brother Peter. Go call him. Peter came and they were instant friends. And he, Jesus loved that Peter so much. But he, was, he struggled with his self-confidence and wanted to please the Lord so desperately. And here we find him having been called from the fishing nets. And God may call you in your life from something to ask you to leave it and follow him. And that's what he means. Leave it. And so after Christ dying and, and being visible to them after he rose from the grave, Peter still went back to his old industry. I would have thought that if it was me, I might have started some sort of witnessing program once the Holy Ghost had come because now I, I had received the Holy Ghost 10 days later and 30 days later, here I am back at the fishing. I'm fishing all night. Why would I be fishing when I was told to leave those nets? And the interesting thing we find here is the Lord Jesus, in verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again, again. So it wasn't there all the time with him, to these disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Now, why they call the Sea of Tiberias, I must explain to my wonderful friends here that haven't been to Israel. The Lake of Galilee has all these towns around it. And when they talk about the Sea of Galilee, they talk about the sea, in the part in front of the city. So they were fishing towards Tiberias area. So it was that sea there and it happened this way. John's describing it. Simon, Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. The fishing boat could not take a lot more people than that. It was not, it's quite small. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter said, and they will go with you, they said. So they went out. And got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. If you wonder why they caught fish at night, it's because the, well, the lake is clear water. It's not salt, so it's very translucent. And in the daytime, the fish, a shoal of fish would see a net. And uh, they wouldn't fish in deep waters because the net wouldn't be able to go down that deep. So they would be not far from the shore. And so you do it at nighttime or early morning when the fish are feeding. And uh, so they fished all night and caught nothing. Hello, this has happened before. Early in the morning, Jesus stood at the shore. But the disciples did not recognize him. I really want us to recognize the Lord when he comes and does things. We're so busy and so focused on our tasks and what we're doing today and what we're going to do that sometimes we don't recognize. Mary goes to the grave with every intention, Mary Magdala, to prepare his body walks right past him because he's not supposed to be there. He's supposed to be in the grave. And because he wasn't supposed to be there, he talks to her. Mary, why are you looking for him here? You've taken him. Where have you taken him to? And he calls her name. She says, Lord, she realizes when he, only when she called his name. Two men walking the road to Emias. He's in, he's in between them talking about all the events of the day. Their fire, the souls are burning with fire. And they still don't recognize him because they don't expect him to be there. God will, in your life, manifest. And angels will be interacting with you all the time. And you won't even recognize it if you're not paying attention. We're very demon conscious. We know when the devil's attacking us or when he's trying to harass us. Well, why aren't you aware of the angels? Or God's presence of the Lord himself. Because you are so valuable to the Lord. You are his prized possession. His prized his heart is for you. He didn't die for anybody else but for you and I. No angel was worth saving, but you were to die for. So that's how important you are. Now stay with me, please. So here we find, if I can get my face in this silly phone, there we open up. All right. And uh, he called out them, friends, have you, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side, which is about four and a half to five feet in distance. The boat's not that wide. And you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's writing this book, that's John. He refers to himself five times this way. No one else does. He had no problem with his self-image. He was about 18 or 19 when he met Jesus. Him and his brother, and he wasn't emotionally damaged, but he didn't do a whole lot that I can see throughout the word. 
until later in life. And his teachings throughout his book, he, the things he grabbed to retell in the gospel was very deep and very strong. He was very confident to relay the gospel in such a level. You know, all our gospels are written much later in life. Christ was born 6 BC and of course in the, in the 20 ADs is when he died. So by 70 AD, when the Gospels were written, it wasn't anymore the disciples, but the, the disciples' disciples. Because, you know, Matthew had his own group around him, and they would, he'd be telling them all the time, teaching from what happened, and they would write these things down. Luke came from Greece, and he reconstructed his information from different authors, and very much detailed as a doctor. And John was a man that was very attentive to the Lord in those short time that he was there in his young years, but he held on to so much. And so here we, we see him writing, and uh, this, this here, Jesus, when they did, they were able to catch the disciple who Jesus now loved, this is John, he said, it's the Lord. He, he's showing how smart he is, because Peter didn't figure it out. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had not taken it off, and jumped into the water, the disciple followed him into the boat, towing the net full of fish. They, had, they were not far off the shore, so he kind of waded into it. They didn't fish deeply. They, that's why they couldn't fish in the daytime, because it's, you can see the bottom of the lake. I'm just teaching you practicality so you understand the word and you read it. Please don't get too excited. Thank you. All right. <laughs> The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the full net of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed and saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Now picture this scene. He has been to the store. He's got a griller. He had a fire starter. He had coals and he had fish and he had bread. He went to buy breakfast. Now, it's amazing how that Jesus always provides what you need today for now. He's so the now God, not the yesterday or tomorrow. He's got everything covered for now. Here they are trying to fish all day to get some provision. He's got you covered. And so he, the other disciples followed him and he says, uh, when they land, he saw a fire. And Jesus in verse 10 says, bring some of the fish that you may have. This have a lot of fish. It's, you know, Jesus was very extravagant. He was not wasteful. But he was extravagant. His, his approach was, let them, we're feeding the 5,000, let them have as much as they want. That's extravagant. There was no rationing. But gather what's left. Don't waste it. Jesus didn't buy his clothes at Dillard's. <laughs> he had his garment woven for him. It was so beautiful that after three days of being dragged through the streets with blood and mire, they were still wanting to cast lots for that garment. It was that beautiful. He never drove a used vehicle. A brand new donkey. You could smell the leather. Verse 14 says, this was the third time the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So in 40 days, this is the third time. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? These people? No, these things that you now have as value, your fishing nets, your boats, your industry. Do you love me more than these things? <laughs> yes, Lord, <laughs> you know that I love you. That's why he's saying, you know, you know, when, when men are kind of awkward, with they don't like to say, I love you a lot. Women are far more affectionate generally, not always the case, but uh, men say, when a woman asks, do you love me? They'll say, yes, I love you. Of course I love you. You know that, you know that I love you. It's almost, almost embarrassing. One night I was in bed, my wife was trying to read. My wife asked me, do you love me? And I, yeah, I love you. What, how do you love me? What? So I was being very spiritual, reading a Christian book. So I said, I love you with the love of the Lord. And she said, oh, good night, brother. It really happened. She really said that. If you love me, you'll feed my sheep. Not your sheep. They're my sheep, but feed them. Again, he said the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Why are you asking? This is awkward. Take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt and offended. So obviously John must have discussed it with him somehow and saw, saw the emotional reaction on him. He was hurt because he asked him a third time, do you love me? You, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And here comes a very important part. I tell you the truth. Jesus would use phraseology like, I tell you. Not because they, because they are his friends or because he's persistent. I tell you. But he said, I tell you the truth. Now, truth in God's understanding of God's communication to us is different to the truth we understand. We think truth is the opposite to lies. But truth supersedes all facts, all understanding, all logic. Facts are nobody can walk on water. Truth is, Peter did. Facts are you have symptoms of sickness. Truth is you're already healed by his stripes already. Facts are you have unsaved loved ones. Truth is, if any man be saved, his whole household will be saved. Facts are you have financial challenges, but truth is that he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. So we live by the truth because he's the way, the truth and the life, and we follow truth. So when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, something profound's about to follow that should get your attention. Now, I would have thought Peter would have been very excited about this and would have been alert, alerted that Jesus said, I tell you the truth. And this is what he says. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. Wow, that's, that's profound. That's like revelation. Wow. And when you were, and went where you wanted. I did. I did. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. How many of you agree this is a prophecy? Now look what John tells us. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Follow me. He had already called him to follow him the first time as he was at the nets. So he was gently coercing him again to take up and follow him again. It seems to me that Peter had functioned in his gifting and commitment to the Lord, but didn't have a ministry yet. Ministry comes from a place of relationship and love for God rather than from an ability. Or even a need. If someone tells me I'm in the ministry because there's a great need or I feel called or I'm gifted or I've, oh, this is something I can do, I love doing it, that's not enough. If you say I love the Lord, you cannot feed his sheep unless you love them, love him. Because the darndest thing with sheep are you have fluffy ones and natty ones and black ones and white ones and obedient, compliant sheep and rebellious, difficult sheep leaving the 99. Always on the internet, you've got to deworm them every Sunday. It's exhausting. You have sheep that are biting the other sheep, sheep that act like goat, and you just don't want to mess with them. You don't want to send those difficult sheep down to Calvin's church and let him struggle with them because you just had all you can take with those difficult sheep. Pastor Calvin can struggle. Why should we st <laughs> and just have the fluffy, good, productive sheep? But if you're driven by love, the sheep cannot disappoint you, cannot frustrate you. It's not for them you're doing it anyway. It's His sheep and what you're doing is for Him. So they can't disappoint, they can't hurt you. Your focus is on Him. And that's where ministry is born in your love for Him. And Jesus prophesies of Him and what really was disturbing for me so long, so many years. I'm thinking, Lord, you have a third time now with your disciples and you're going to prophesy over someone that you really like and regard. And this is the best prophecy you could come up with. Even Peter felt the way I felt because he wanted to exchange it. Calvin, exchange that prophecy. Don't like it, just turn it in. And Peter turned to and saw that the disciple, that's not John, whom Jesus loved, John, again he says it twice now, was following him, the one who leaned back against and said, Jesus at the supper table, uh, who's, who's going to betray you? So verse 21, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about John? He just got a profound prophetic word from the Son of God who's risen from the dead in a glorified body. It should have been, but not. It's like, what about John then? Uh, what kind of words is he going to get? Don't you give him a better word than you gave me. That's what he's saying. And the response of Jesus is, 
What is it to you if I, if I remain until I come? What is it to you if I must keep him? You must follow me. You must not be focused on him. Because he was frustrated with his duty. He didn't respond to that prophecy. And I'm thinking, Lord, surely you could have given him a word about his future, his ministry, how many people it impact, something to encourage them, something to give him value, to cling to something. This is not can possibly be the best. Well, when you are old, someone else will lead you. You don't want to go. Yay. <laughs> I can't wait. Thanks, Ed Trout. Um, do I still have to give an offering for that prophecy? No, thank you. I'd rather just let the country smash by. It's a strange prophecy. And yet it was valuable at the right time. We get prophetic words that we don't understand and we don't appreciate. But God is setting things in motion and depositing things in us for the right time. Because 10 years later, there was, you know, we had a dynasty of Herods and there was this Herod. He was so egotistical. He was Tiberius' nephew, I believe it was. And he was just a, a, a pompous guy. And he kills James, who's now the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He runs a sword, has a sword run through him. And the Jews are elated and excited. They're stamping out these crazy Christians, the sect. And so when he sees this, they were excited. He says, well, let's get one of the most high profile guys, Peter. And they, they, they arrest him and they put him in jail. But now it's Passover and no Jew will do any kind of difficulty with anybody during the Passover. You've got to take it seriously. So they had to imprison him until the Passover had passed. So Herod thought, I don't know about this. These Christians, they got a powerful something or other because something's going to happen. He had so much confidence that God would do something. So he put 16 soldiers guarding one man in prison and chained him because he was expecting something to happen. Meanwhile, in a home not far, close in the same town, there is a group praying now. They're all frantic for Peter's life. They're praying earnestly. You'll read this in Acts chapter 12. Just for your information, Barnabas, who was a very well-respected leader in Jerusalem, it was his sister's home that they were praying all night. And of course, his sister's son, you might know as Mark. That was just let you know, it's all in the Bible. I want to interest you to read your Bibles. It's all there. It's very exciting. <laughs> so Mark was Barnabas' nephew. And in this home, they had the gathering. They were really on fire family. And they had a whole lot of guys praying. And so Peter is in jail for these few days. And he's chained between Luigi and Mario. <laughs> because they're Roman soldiers. And it must have been quite a challenge to sleep with these two garlic-breathing, hairy men. Every night. And this same Peter, but 10 years earlier, was the one that denied the Lord at a fire place and told the woman, I told you, I don't know him. And here he is completely relaxed and sleeping the night before the trial. Acts 12 says, the night before his trial, he was sleeping. The whole church is praying, he's sleeping. And the reason was simply, he got a word. He got a word that he'd be old. And he was so full of confidence, he had seen he had physically lived whatever Jesus said would happen. So when the feeding of the 5,000, I know you all think Jesus fed the 5,000. That's not what the Bible says. He said, what do we have to feed them with? I mean, that's a ridiculous thing. 5,000 people, what do we, where do we carry such food? Well, there's <laughs> a young guy with a foot of fish and bread here. Okay, bring him. God always takes what you have. We always think we need to get something from God that he can use us when in fact you've got something that he wants to use. You really have something he wants. I mean, I could see Moses in front of that burning bush. Uh, how will they know you sent me? Okay. What do you have in your hand? Nothing. The other hand. Oh, it's a stick. It seems in your life so insignificant that you don't have anything, but you've got something God wants. And it only will work when you surrender it. If you'll surrender, then God can do something with it. 
And he saw these fish and the bread. So what the Bible tells me, they took the three fish and these loaves, divide them amongst the 12 disciples. Now my mathematics tells me three fish, 12 disciples, that means Peter got a quarter of this little fish. I could see Peter's face with this piece of bread and fish. Uh, Run this by me again, Jesus. Uh, What must you do with this? Excuse me, Andrew, excuse me in the way. Space, please, thank you. Um, Bubble, bubble, thank you. Okay, now tell me again, I must give, feed them, and I must tell them they can have as much as they want. Right, right, right. So from Jesus to the people, something had to happen. In our lives, we get the command or the instruction or the teaching or the impartation from the Lord. And from the Lord to the people, something has to happen. And once we see it happen, it generates such a faith and an anointing in our hearts. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And so the next morning, Jesus is walking on the water towards them. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. Don't be afraid. It's me. And Peter, who's not the smartest man in school, he says, if that's you, he just says it's him. (laughs) If that's you, tell me to come. Because now he'd learned that if Jesus said it, it's going to happen. And so he gets this mega prophecy, come. Wow, that's... That's, what, that's it? That's what I'm getting? You know, if he was from Colorado Springs, at least ask for confirmation. <laughs> if he was a leader, he would have had a church board meeting. So what do you guys feel about me walking in the water? James and John, sons of thunder. What are your short-term and long-term goals as walking on the water? Are you starting a ministry for walking on the water? What's the walking in the water thing? And then the bookkeeper, Judas. Uh, we just don't have the finance now. If you drown, we can't find your body. There is no way we can employ someone. It's not happening, dude. This is not happening. And there's Thomas. What if it's not the Lord? <laughs> I mean, there's no way of consulting those guys. Peter just got out of the boat and he walked. And when he walked, he saw what Jesus said. And when he got his mind and thought life off the word, he began to sink. If you start thinking... You start sinking. The devil loves to fill your mind with thoughts. You're going to die of COVID. COVID's going to kill you. Right. (laughs) Please don't believe that. Please don't let the devil lie to you. Fill your heart and mind with God's word. God's word. And so... This Peter had learned this, so now he's in jail and he's quite comfortable. Church is praying frantically. He's, he's, he's chained and they're going to kill him tomorrow. He's not praying, he's not singing, he's not witnessing, he's sleeping because Jesus said he's going to be old. Nobody can kill him because he actually believes what Jesus said. Paul gets a word, he's in a, he finds himself in a storm. You know, I'm so glad that when we're in a storm, we can talk and call upon the Lord, He'll hear us. And they're in 14 days in the ship in, in Acts 27. In the first 12 chapters of, of Acts is Peter and the rest is all Paul. And so we're in chapter 27 where he's calling upon God because the whole, a lot of them given up hope for being saved. And the angel comes and says, Paul, you have to be before Caesar. And all those with you, God has granted their lives. Totally, thank you. And so he tells them and encourages them. And he's got a word, he's going to appear before Caesar. The first thing that happens on the island is a snake. Of all the 365 people, it had to be... Don't you ever feel like, why me, Lord? Why? Why, Lord? Why? Can it happen to Pastor Andre, Prophet Andre rather? Why me? It happens, so much happens. And the snake is dangling off Paul's hand. And he shaked she got into fire because he had a word that he's going to Caesar. The same word in the storm is not any different now. And you may go through one crisis after another, but the promise is still holds true. God doesn't go back on his word. His, his word is yes and amen. It's not man that he should lie. What he said he'll do, he'll do it. It's that simple. It's not, you're not that weak that God can change his mind every five minutes. No, he's got given you a promise, you're doing it. You, someone else, you're going to be so old, Peter, that someone else will lead you. So he's, and they're praying, oh God, oh God. So they, and I, I'm so disappointed in that church, in, the, in this woman's house, because 
When Peter's finally released, he knocks on the door. It's late at night, so the little Rhoda opens the hatch. <gasps> Peter! And she runs back, she forgets to open the door, duh. And she tells, it's him, it's him, it's Peter. They're going, Kura Moshe, oh, it's late at night. Oh, Lord, just deliver my brother. It's him, it's Peter. It, it can't be him, it must be his ghost. <laughs> what? What? His ghost? I mean, what, what, how crazy. You're actually praying, believing for it, and you, when it happens, you're shocked. If you don't get expectant when you ask the Lord, you're not going to receive. We come, I was, I'm actually American. I've been living here for 22 years, but we used to live in South Africa. In South Africa, everybody has burglar bars. Everybody. They have barbed wire around on their, on their fences and they have security and lights and dogs. It's, a, it's like you're in a jail because there's so much high crime. But in my neighborhood where I lived, I was the only house that didn't have burglar bars or any kind of security. And I was never broken into. They broke into all the houses around me. They didn't touch me. And the people asked me why. I even drove a minivan, which they told me it's the worst vehicle. It gets hijacked. They didn't hijack me. didn't bother me. When I sold the vehicle after two years, the person who bought it, two weeks later, was hijacked. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's not because I'm bitter. I wasn't expecting it. My expectancy was the Lord is going to watch over me. That was my expectancy. My expectancy is not to get COVID. I don't, you know, we create that fear. We tell our children, don't you climb that tree. You'll fall out and break an arm. Don't you be walking alone because you know these guys will, they'll abduct you. We create that expectancy in people by saying those things. We've got to, we are the salt of the earth. They're not going to get hope in this nation from the Buddhists or the Mohammedans. Or the, they're going to get it only from the living church. We are the salt of the earth. So let us get it right and speak the truth in the way it is. So what is the Lord saying? If it's you, tell me to come. Get a word. My pastor was talking about faith. He said today he was saying that people have a lot of hope. It's so true that we all have hope and we think it's faith because we even have a scripture. But the scripture is a dead letter until the Holy Ghost brings it to life. And so what happens is faith only comes by hearing. So when I'm facing a crisis of any kind, no matter what the promises are in the Bible, I have to pray until God has made it real to me or revealed or given me a rhema or spoken a word to me. And once I've got a word, I've got it down. Jehoshaphat knew it. He saw it being attacked and he was full of panic and they prayed. And when, as soon as he got a prophetic word that you wanted to fight, God's going to rescue. He praised God as if it's all settled. Nothing had changed, but he got a word. It's good enough for him. We believe God. So we live by God's word. When Jesus says, I tell you the truth, that's what it is. He got God's word and we live by God's word and faith comes by hearing. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, apparently you can. All right, good. I hope I taught you something before we start ministering prophetically. I know you didn't come to hear me teach. For those interested, uh, we do have a... Uh, web page, you want to look and get a file. We do daily devotions every day, propheticlife.com. I also have an app. We have an app. You can just type my name in and get the, at the app store and, or Prophetic Life, and you can download that. And there's lots of interesting, exciting things that we try to create a prophetic community. So that's that. And then uh, Prophet Andre uh, is, I have many spiritual sons that I'm very thankful and so thrilled about because that's what I was called to do. God didn't, I was a pastor and God called me to prophetic ministry and that was a treat. When God called me to prophetic ministry, I had a wife and two children at the time. I have three children and nine grandkids now and I, he asked me to live by faith and raise up a prophetic ministry and train people in prophetic and I was a pastor very young and I said God I don't know what that is except that prophets are always in trouble every prophet I read about they're just getting killed stoned they're just in misery they're not happy people so I didn't want that and then that, living by faith wasn't for me I was getting a very minimal salary from the church and I just couldn't do that now and my excuse was I had a wife and children and I felt in my heart that I was justified. I, I had responsibility. I said to the Lord, if I was single, it wouldn't, but you understand, I mean, really be reasonable, God. I've got responsibility. Months went by and on the way to church one Monday morning to do my normal duties, my wife and one three-year-old who's now works for me, she's just turned 40, uh, were in the vehicle and we crossed the railway track and the vehicle died on the track. And the train was a coming. 
I did all I could to get that vehicle off that track, but I couldn't. It wouldn't start, it wouldn't move. And the train came and hit the vehicle and this voice said to them, so, you're so responsible, you almost killed your family, give them to me and I'll take better care and do what I tell you. Now, if you say God wouldn't do that, please tell Jonah. Because Jonah is a living proof of that God will. If you belong to the Lord and you don't do what he says, he's got ways and means. Because he loves you too much to leave you in disobedience. And so since that day to this, I've been doing this and I am really called of God to train people in their ministry. And I have a, I have a fiery vision in my soul to make every child of God effective in their ministry as fast as possible, to get them as effective as possible, the kingdom of God can advance. And I especially like to get the prophets going at full speed. That's my biggest heart's desire. And Andre is my top spiritual son. Uh, he came to me six years ago. He was already in the ministry, but we, we honed his prophetic skills considerably. Uh, what he did, which was different to every other son I had, is he took time, money, and effort and followed me around the world. Came to countries where I was just to learn from me. And I remember him saying to me, I want to learn all I can while you're alive, before you die. <laughs> That's what he said to me. So I said to him, am I going to die sometime soon? <laughs> That's what I said to him, and he tried to, and he gets this funny laugh of his. Anyway, so I'm still alive after six years. I don't know. Have I, got, have I got a couple more years? He says he doesn't want to reinvent the wheel, he wants to learn all he can, and he did. He learned a lot, and there is such a demand on his ministry. Besides the accuracy of his prophetic gift, I, I don't know anyone that can talk about intimacy with the Lord and relationship. He makes me cry every time he talks. I just love to hear him and his relationship with the Lord is so beautiful. He goes to movies and to dinner with the Lord alone on a Monday morning or quiet when no one's there. It's the, he buys a Coke and a popcorn for, for the Lord. <laughs> buys him a ticket. And I hope he'll tell you, I hope Sunday he'll talk about it because it's so moving to me. And he's had some uncanny experiences. I mean, there was a guy recently from Angola. Was it Angola? He was a hitman, and he, he was in the corner eating with the Lord, and he even orders of the menu as the Lord tells him, and, and he has this whole conversation with the Lord like a, like a crazy person. And, uh, <clears throat> and this other man came in there huffing and puffing, and he was upset because he knew something was going on in that corner. And he was trying to just leave, be alone with the Lord, and he, this man's all uh, interfering. He says, I know something. They don't know, but I know something's going on here. Along the short of it, he was a hitman to, assigned to kill someone. And he came in there, and he knew something going on. And after hearing him talk, he wanted to get saved. And he got turned, turned on to Jesus that day. <laughs> Pretty amazing. But there's many experiences like that, and I'm sure he'll share with you. Come stand with me, Andre. He has the most beautiful wife. It looks like a model. She's a, she'll be here also this weekend. She's actually a dentist. Uh, she specializes, not in dentistry, but she is a dentist, but specializes in Botox. I'll tell her to bring her equipment. What do you think? <laughs> All that other stuff. It does more than, just more, more than Botox, right? Yes, yeah, more than, it didn't do much for you. Yeah, I suppose, I don't know. Anyway, they, and they have two boys that, um, and they still live in South Africa, but we're hoping to get them over here. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor, would you pick some people that you think that really could use ministry right now before I get going too fast? Think of someone you don't like. <laughs> Give you two minutes. All right. Thank you, Jesus. How about you, uh, prophetess or pastor, Barbara, Miss B, where are you, Miss B? That's not like you back there. Okay. Can you pick four or five for me? The first one. Hi, Tracy. And then pick four more while I'm busy with Tracy, okay? Hi, Tracy. Are you married? Would you like to be? Have you asked the Lord? Because it's a, after salvation is a very important relationship. It's going to affect what God's called you to do. You've answered the Lord's call and you've offered your services to the Lord, much like Isaiah. You said, here am I, send me. And you are dynamic. You have a lot of ability. It's true. No one has to wonder what you're thinking. You'll tell them and you'll, you'll spill it out and you'll make it clear. You're an extremely good, clear communicator. There's no question. But you also have a champion heart. You have a heart of gold and there's no evil in you. And uh, you, you've grown so much through the calamities or the challenges of your life. There's no question. They did you a lot of good. The devil couldn't harm you. He did you 
good. With all the difficulties you went through, it made you stronger. But you have so much to offer. And I'm here to tell you that there is ministry ahead of you. There's no question. There's a time when you cannot do secular work, although you're very capable. And you'll be a great help to the ministry around you. But not only are you intercessor, but you are very prophetic. And you will flow in the giftings that all God has for you. And all that you went through is only, only added to who the value you are and understanding that you have for God. Now, I hear the little whispering in my ear must tell you that the Lord has sent an assigned angelic ministry into your home to fix some things in your family. He doesn't need your help. He's going to repair the broken bridge. He's going to repair it. That's God's promise to you. So he's busy working very hard and very delicately at the same time. So just stand back and let God do it. And you keep focusing on what God's called you to do. He's got you covered. There's also a breakthrough. I don't know what you do for a living, but there's a breakthrough that you need because it's been a kind of a strange situation that you need God to help you with, a, with, a, with intervention, with a financial thing and to work for you. Because you're good at what you do and God's got you covered. Great. Amen. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, Tracy, um, you are at a pause right now in your life and uh, kind of like a standstill. God is busy speeding things up and I see in the spirit three months. God is saying, give him three months and he's going to start to put things back into place in your life very quickly. I see relationships that was lost and also personal relationships that God's bringing healing and restoration to that's going to happen fast in your life. And you love his accent. All right, thank Tracy, you're a blessing. And you will get married, just, just, just as you know, just a side, sidebar, you will get married, there's no question. No, you'll not walk alone, that's not God's plan for you, no doubt in my mind. All right, so you're someone else, Miss Bob? Who? So, so what, you, tell me your names for the recording. For which one is Fred? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I try not to be a joke. So Fred, what, what do you do? You are such a faithful man. You've made such good decisions lately. I the, want to tell you the Lord is absolutely thrilled and pleased with you. There are some people that just don't understand you. They think you're a little crazy with your spiritual. He got, he got Jesus. He's the, they make fun of you, but you are a man of God. There is just no question. You understand the things of the Spirit. You have advanced greatly. And you are touching people's lives. There are those that make fun of you and talk about you behind your back. But they are such respect for you. They're the same people. That they will, you will have many salvations because of your testimony. With people that just keep going because you are making your light shine. There's another house that you asked the Lord for. It's been in the pipeline and God's got you covered. It is in, already in motion. So it's going to come a lot sooner than you think. As for you, ma'am, the, the Lord has broken a curse of sickness and it's repeated itself in the family. You'll never have disease or cancer or sickness. It'll never touch you. God has promised you that. Do not be fearful ever, ever. God's got you covered. You're very sensitive and you, you stress about things unnecessarily, but you've got a very generous and kind heart. You've got a very sweet spirit and your, your real ministry is a heart of mercy because you will show everyone and anyone mercy to try and help and fix those things. But there is a loved one in your family you absolutely grieve over and God has heard the cries of your heart. God has heard it and he will not disappoint you. He will intervene and do a supernatural thing. He will do it for you. He's going to help you. You hear God much more than you think you do. You both are very gifted and uh, you are great leadership and you've, God's advancing you. You will have many spiritual disciples around you. Go. Uh, Fred, uh, God has completely forgiven you. I see something has happened in the past and the Lord is saying from this night on as you move on that the enemy has no right ever again to hold that against you. I see the authority level in your life that is rising for a long time. You've led people, but God says that from now on you will lead them with a greater authority. I see the exact same thing that Prophet Ed speaks about with your family, family member. I see the Lord's busy intervening in that situation with that family member uh, today. Ms. B? Yeah, we were at five. This is now just three. Okay, that's your quota. Thank you. And one more. Okay, good. What's your name, the tall, the tall fella? What's your name? Angelo. All right, Angelo, are you, how old are you, may I ask? 30. Are you serious? You look so young. Are you married? And what do you do, do, Angelo? You're at Bible school? 
Okay, you've made some changes in your life and uh, the devil was hard after you for some time and you <laughs> didn't do everything the way you were supposed to and boy, you just had some narrow escapes. God had to intervene. And here the word of the Lord for you is you didn't, you didn't waste those years. They will not be lost. God will make up for the years you wish you could have changed. So don't look back and have regrets because God has a way of making everything work together for good. Because now you're trying to convert the whole family and everyone's got to get what you, and they don't understand all of it. But there will be a following and there'll be a time in your life when you will pass to your own church, but not yet. Take it slow. Take it one step at a time. Let the Lord open the right doors. He'll do that. You have another country in your scopes. You want to go somewhere else, but God's got plans for you here. There's a young generation that he wants you to aim at. You have all kinds of talents, but you didn't finish things. You have music. You have so many abilities. You have so many things you started and didn't quite finish it. You're going to do all that. And God's changing the way you feel about yourself. You're going to become a completer. Next to you, are you the family of yours? They're friends of yours. What's your name, sir? Muhammad. And your name, ma'am? Hi, Susan. And you're married, right? And how many children do you have? Okay, no, none right now. My kind of language. <laughs> so, Muhammad, what do you do, sir? You're in the ministry? What do you do? Teach pastor what? And a missionary where? To Turkey. That's wonderful. There's a lot happening in the East that God is doing. Uh, we know that a lot of Muslims are moving in to Europe, but people don't know how many people are being converted in the East. It's rapid fire going on over there, and they're trying to escape because of persecutions, what I keep hearing when I go to Europe. But it's, uh, I'm very thrilled as we're living in very interesting times. And uh, I'm grateful for your own heart. Uh, the word of the Lord comes to me. The first thing that I hear from the Lord is to tell him not to get weary in well-doing for in the right season you're going to reap. You've been laboring and you've been pushing and trying and making and you haven't seen the results you want to see yet, but don't give up because it's coming. It's coming, all the results. You've knocked on so many doors. You've tried to open up doors all over the, the, in the different uh, nations and different ministries you're trying to open and it just won't work. People not working with you. And God says, that you're not to give up, you, you're actually plowing in a field that hadn't been plowed before, enough. So God's gonna give you the success and he's gonna connect you with the right people. You will have people all over the world that you will know, not only in Turkey that'll help with the things of the Lord. There's no question that Turkey is having a visitation of God. There's no question that Turkey will return. There was a time that Turkey acknowledged the Lord and that they are restoring and being returned to the Lord. There's no question about that. The roots are coming back and it's going to cause a lot of friction around the borders, but it's going to be an amazing thing that God will do in Turkey. So I'm glad to know that. As for you, my sister, you're a delight to the Lord. You're such a, a, a servant. Nothing's too much trouble. You're always willing to do and give and help and God celebrates you for that. Uh, you don't have to explain or apologize to anybody. God's delighted in you. He loves you just as you are. You're a little administrator, bookworm. You get things done. You'll organize the most finest details and uh, you were born for this purpose. Your whole life you looked to find where you belonged. You just never fit in with other girls at school. Something was always different about you. God had prepared you for something completely unique in such a way that you would not feel strange doing the strange things you're doing now. You've had some unusual encounters where God has intervened and done amazing miracles for you that you have hard even explaining or retelling to someone else, but the Lord has done great things for you. So at this point in your time, you're in a season of, of waiting and just holding, your, just holding steady, but there's a lot of breakthroughs coming early next year and then later next year with the new break breakthroughs. There's no question. I see several churches that you will be very involved in establishing, not one or two, but several. You'll put, both of you will put structure to the church and help raise up ministries because they're very green and uneducated and fired up, but they have no idea how to do that. Okay, please don't get too excited, Muhammad. 
Amen. Um, Angelo, I hear the Lord saying that he's bringing a friend back. I see a friend that served the Lord, but he went astray. And God is giving you a promise tonight. He's bringing him back and he will serve God with you. And sir, uh, Muhammad, you're, the gift that God has given you is training. You're a very good trainer. Yes, you're a preacher and all of that, but I see new training material that's been compiled and it's getting ready to be shipped into all the world. And I see God's bringing that release. Nothing that you've written before. You're going to write it now as going to be sent out. Then, ma'am, I see, Lord, your relationship specifically right now, there's been people throughout your life that are speaking against relationships and also against your relationship. And God is setting you free tonight from any negative seed or word was spoken over your relationship as your marriage and also friendships and relationships. A tap for you, but not for me. That's ridiculous. Pastor, are you ready? Pastor, go ahead. Weston Clark. Weston Clark. Good to meet you. Please stay standing, sir. Is your family next to you? Uh, I have my daughter. My wife is not feeling well at all. We have seven kids all Lord have mercy. <laughs> okay, so can your kids stand with you? The ones that are here? Do you want to go first? What do you do for work, sir? Okay, uh, I've got no idea what that means, but that's great. Um, <laughs> I, I hear the Lord saying lost contracts, lost contracts is coming back. I see contracts in business that you've worked on and then it, there was a delay and stopped. God is saying he's releasing that and he's bringing it back to you. The fact that you are alive today is only God's grace. I see how the enemy <laughs> kept several times to attack you. I see a recent accident that took place where the enemy tried to take you. You and a couple of people, but God has positioned you there. God has raised you up in the marketplace. You are in the church and connected to God's people, but he's raising you up in public, in the marketplace to become a light of him. And what I really, what I'm, uh, the reason I'm drawn to you tonight is the fact that you have no fear. You don't fear anything. Brother, may I appeal to you and the, with the Lord that you would develop an ability not to react or get overexcited because uh, you get so frustrated, it's almost overwhelming. And God's teaching you when you panic or react, the faith is absent. And there are many challenges. Oh my goodness. Just when guys agree to a thing and then they have this trouble and that thing goes wrong and that thing breaks down. They don't come, didn't arrive and it's late. It's constant and it frustrates you because you arranging things at a rapid speed. You move at the speed of lightning, of light. And so you just have a lot of going on. And I, I thought once we to ask you to appeal to you to, to calm. And when things are, they mustn't even know that there's a problem. People must want you to panic and you're just totally calm. If you'll do that, the Lord will work on your behalf. He wants to, he wants to use this image to impact the people that you're touching around you. Because there are those that, because of your personality, will try to push buttons in you. Specifically, there's a jealous spirit that follows you that tries to steal everything you have. And so if you just keep calm and don't let on what you know or think, you know, it's like playing poker, don't keep a poker face and let them wonder, what does what he know? What does he know? What does he know? And you've you got God on your side. Because God will, let not, he will not let the righteous be forsaken. But you must be as if you're completely confident and that, so that faith must be generated in your heart. It's very important. And you're going into a season that you're reestablishing connections that were lost. Uh, and they said it can't happen and just tore your heart out because you worked so hard and so many hours. And it's like, what, what? And God says, calm it down. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. No one can take away from me what I give nobody. And that you will get what's rightfully yours and then some. I'm going to shake them up because there are those that are trying to steal from you what's rightfully yours. And so he's going to just be calm and watch God move in your behalf and be firm. And I'll give you instructions as you go along and you'll move calmly with such sureness that I will, I will show you who's the boss. No question. So these are your wonderful girls, two of, the, two of the many. And what is your name, the taller one? Ashton. How old are you, Ashton? 13. Uh, practically all grown up, right? A teenager. And so the fun begins. Yeah. What do you want to do with your life? You don't know yet? Ashton, actually, you're not the normal teenager. You're much more dependable and stable and very practical, all grown up. And, 
and uh, just still trying to find your way, but you're not a troublesome child at all. Uh, you will deal with things and you have a certain value system. You're very creative. Your, your ability is to create. You're a designer. Whatever you do, you have to design something, whether it's designing clothes, designing graphics, something you must create. It's your natural nature to do that. Uh, you're very sensitive and you feel a little hurt by your friends that kind of burn you. You don't understand that. The best friend you're ever going to have is Jesus. You must have your expectancy in him and people will not leave you alone because you'll have full of life and joy. Do you understand? Okay, but you're a sweetheart in God's hands on your life, no question. You will go to college. You will definitely qualify and get an education that's very special. What's your name next to her? Keely? Am I saying it right? Um, you, uh, how old are you? 11. She's a m tough one. This one is a tough one. <laughs> From the day she was born, it's... F uh, only, she only understands when. There is no, she can't even play a board game without being the winner. She has to win. And every sport, and, and she's just got focused and uh, she wants to run the whole household if she could because she's got that natural go get them. I wonder where she got that from. <laughs> but uh, she's, got a, she's a real winner and she'll do it. She'll always find a way. She's not a giver upper. She's a good friend to have too, good friend. She has to, needs a little push to come to education. She kind of cuts the corners and doesn't do the homework, but you need to give her a little push and she'll do it, okay? Thank you so much. Got anything for the kids? No? Yes, no? Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody else, Pastor? Joshua? Josh and Bevan Bolt. You don't know where they are? Way back yonder. Hello, Uncle Josh. What do you do for a living, sir? You're a missionary where? You're not sure? Where? Where? In any particular country? Wow, thank you for doing that. And uh, so you both work in the same industry? Uh, you're an interesting man. What's amusing to me, Sir Josh, is that people underestimate you most times. They all, you come across with a project and you want to promote it and people don't take you seriously initially. It takes time for them to figure out that you are, you're here to stay and you're going to do it. You are going to do it. Because it seems like you would sell this big market, this big project, and it just seems like, yeah, whatever, we heard this before. But the truth is you're very, very determined about it. And you're going to keep going after it with all of your heart because you're an organizer. It's your natural nature. You don't know how to do a small project. It's very hard for you. You've always got the next big crazy scheme going on. No matter what, you still not even finished the one and you're ready with the next one. Because it's your nature, because you're a, you are a visionary. You, talk, you say you're a missionary, but I think you're a visionary. You will, you, mob, you will mobilize other ministries because you see how things should and could and needs to be. It's who you are. And uh, you can really sell the project. I mean, when you married your wife, when you met her, you sold her the project of getting married. You sold it to her well, hard. And she, when she looked at her life, she thought, how did I get, how did this happen? And... <clears throat> And uh, you move so fast for her sometimes because she is very stately and uh, very detailed and she's very steady. And when you move too fast for her, she looks back and she wonders, what happened? What just happened now? But because she, she's able to really sum the whole picture up, she's very clear. She has a spirit of clarity about her that she understands and sees the whole picture and she reads people well and she listens carefully. She doesn't like to be pressurized or make a move too fast. She needs to work at her own pace and see things at her own pace because she'll get it done right. It's who she is. But she's a great help and she really believes in what you're doing. And uh, the Lord is touching you. My sister, as I'm sure you uh, consider yourself completely healthy and wealthy and blessed, but I see the Lord touching you physically as I'm speaking to you. Uh, he's, that you will not need medical attention. God's going to fix it. He's going to demonstrate His faithfulness to you and heal something in your body that you will and put everything back in, all the clockwork back in order. He's going to fix everything for you. Uh, Josh, don't ever wonder whether what you've been doing, whether it's been effective or not. 
Because I hear the Lord saying tonight, He's saying you've been more effective than a lot of ministers out there because of your availability and readiness. If God comes in and is looking for someone that'll do it, it comes to your house because He knows that you'll respond immediately, you'll react. Now, for a long time, you have not had the resources that you've needed. And I sense a release of resources that's coming to your life. And ma'am, I don't know uh, what you do, but there is an anointing on you for property. And I want to encourage you to pray for people. Pray for people for property. And even if you pray for property for yourself, real estate, I see there's a release that's coming. There's an anointing that you carry. It's a generational anointing. It's upon you. Grace Viha? Vihal. Grace Vihal. I get the names for the recording so we know. Hi, Grace. How old are you, sweetie? 18. I was 18 once. <laughs> Long time ago. Are you married? In love what? No. Just no. <laughs> and what do you, who do you belong to? Is mom and dad here? Uh, my mom's right there and then my dad. Mom, where are you? Show me. I love mom. And dad is where? Security in the hallway. All right. I like security. Feel, it makes me feel safe. So, what are you going to do with your life? You're not sure yet. Woman of vision. I love it. All right. You're a go get him girl. Uh, nothing happens easily or quietly. Everything happens with a, with, a, with, a, with a seriousness around you. You get things done. The anointing is on you. There's no question. God has blessed you. It's a new day in your life and God's going to lead you step by step. What he's looking for is a complete yieldedness because you've had several confusing signals to you, not sure what to do, but you're very smart. You're a natural leader. You are separated and called to the ministry. When you're a little girl, you asked God to call you and use you. Ask God for it. Now you've got all other, all millions of other ideas right now going on all at the same time. And you are very smart, make no mistake, but there is a journey you'll walk first in the natural before you walk the spiritual journey and that ministry type journey, that's God where God's planned it. He's not called you to date several guys. You can only date one and marry one. There's not going to be a lot of different men in your life. because God has kept you for himself. You have a mega influence on the young people. Somehow young people follow you. They look to you. They trust you because you have a great ability and personality to touch lives and a confidence that's great. You have many talents. You have music inside of you that God would like to use for his glory. And there's songs that you will sing. There'll be a season of your life that you'll be a musical player, a big role, and then it'll just pass. So don't let it be your life because your life is the Lord and his purpose for you. His hand is upon you, no question. Uh, we we have so many ideas and visions, but take one step at a time. God moves it one step at a time, and He's going to bless you. He's got a great plan. You're on target right now, and He will not let you make a mistake. He'll lead you one step at a time, okay? Got it? Go. Amen. Music, 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 definitely. Uh, now, you are very talented and gifted, but you get bored easily, and then you don't, I mean, you just walk away from it. But I want to encourage you today to press through because that is a door that God's going to open and use to open a lot of things in your future. Music will always be part of your life further. Now, I also see you uh, being a presenter in the future, presenting. I see uh, uh, um, standing and uh, a dialogue that's taking place on a set, and you are presenting on that set. Okay, bless you. John and Michelle Cormina. 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 John and Michelle, would you mind standing for me, please? Thank you. John and Michelle, my bell. These are words that go together well. So, <clears throat> well, well. Uh, so what do you do, sir? Uh, IT hardware installation. IT hardware installation. And you, Michelle? Uh, the sad thing for me, Michelle, is that you have always been profoundly prophetic, just never had confidence in it. You always knew things, you always saw things, and you had this, this uh, rejection on you since you're a child. And so when someone would bark at you, you would, you would cower and jump back, and they said you didn't like what you said, and that's a mistake. You cannot please 
everybody. You cannot be determined, or think of yourself through people's eyes. It's what God thinks of you. And God absolutely delights in you, Michelle. You are such a sweetheart and unselfish. You bring life to everybody. You give of yourself so much to people and God is for you, with you. There is a, I know he does IT. I'm sure he's doing very well, but there's a financial release and breakthrough that's really going to be extra, extraordinary for the two of you. That God's going to empower you to do the things he's called you to do. Uh, he's he's left, let you leave one ministry because you're going to have your own. That you'll touch people's lives and you can't stop what God has for you because you, you were called to set people free and to bring the word of the Lord to them. And so you, you are a strong deliverer and the word of God will they'll know the truth and it'll set them free. It's part of your job, but you've got to get on with that. You, you're grieving in your soul over one of your loved ones you're concerned for, you fret about them, you don't sleep at night, the tears run on your pillow. That's how much you stress about it. And God says, it's time for you to really give it to me. You say, I give them to you, but you don't really. You take it right back after you prayed. Give them to me, let me take care of them. They're my kids too. I will do it. I will not fail you. You did not fail. You did not fail. You're so quick to take blame and take responsibility. It's not yours to take. So because you're a sweetheart, but you are really an amazing woman of God and an asset to God's kingdom. As for you, sir, the, the Lord has turned away a spirit of death that keeps repeating itself in your family. And canny death situations and God has broken the curse of disease and sickness and all kinds of methods because he's got plans for you you've been robbed blind and you've lost a lot in your life and God wants to restore to you what's rightfully yours the, the devil may not get away with what he's done to you and God is going to replenish that and your joy will not be in the replenishing or the restoration but your joy will be in the faithfulness of God because he's your helper your home will become a haven of salvation and blessing you will have always have a traffic of volume of people in your home it's not God's not calling you to start a church he's calling you just to help people and you'll put them in the right churches where they're supposed to be some will be coming here and that's part of what you'll be working with unchurched people broken people you can't help it but just you just nobody gets rejected by you nobody nobody it's who you are anybody can come you have the heart of the master go uh, Michelle I hear the Lord saying that uh, uh, there's a, a cycle of being treated unfairly in your life. And God is breaking that cycle tonight of, of being treated. Now there is a fight that's going on and God's saying, let go and walk away from that completely. This is not your fight to fight. Now you are a fighter. Uh, everything in your life has come with a fight. I see as a young girl already, um, everything, the challenge in the family. But God's saying he's turning that season around. You're entering a season of peace. And I see the peace of the Lord also entering your household and resting upon your house. Now, sir, the Lord has called you to live a life free of debt. And God is saying that He's touching your debt and He's going to do something supernatural for you at this age, this season of your life. And you will have a testimony of what God has done and you will not go back into debt. God's calling you to live debt free completely. I do want to say to you, brother... It may sound very trivial to you, but you, you're inclined to gather junk. You're inclined to keep everything and get rid of nothing. And then when you, yeah, no, 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 him, brother. No, I said brother, him. And, uh, and then when you need it, you can't find it anyway. And you have to go buy a new one. It's just strange. And you need to, the Lord, what I'm telling you, the Lord says, let go. Don't hold on to anything. Lose that mentality. Uh, don't hold on to stuff. Only what you really need, it, you keep clustering your life. Let go of the stuff. And God will always take care of you. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, come here. I want you to it's out, pick now. Pick. Um, this lady here in front with the brown. What's your name? Penny. Penny. Oh, Penny. 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 Yes. Do you want to tell us his name? Dwayne. Where is Dwayne? Dwayne. You didn't bring him? Tell him I'm looking for him, okay? What do you do? A nurse and a massage therapist. You know, uh, you were um, kind of analytical about so many things because you try to understand things and you always think things, you, you should have done this better and done that better, but actually you've done nothing wrong. God wants to make it clear to you the things that you're going through, the things that you haven't just struggled with right now, you have done absolutely nothing wrong. The enemies come to steal, divide and destroy and God is not going to leave things the way they are. God is working on your behalf and He is pleased with you. Do you understand? Now you get angry, it's true, it's true. And you don't know how you get, and your anger is not even anger, it's frustration. 
because you try so hard. There's nothing you won't do or try just to make it better. And no matter if you try, you try that, you try this, it's always not good enough. Today it stops. The Lord says, I'm not going to have you in torment anymore and feeling like you're less than and not good enough because you wrestle in your sleep. Do you know that you toss and turn a lot in your sleep, that you're restless because of this, your soul's in torment? And I'll release you from that today because you are a sweetheart and a blessing. You must know that. You're very smart and good at everything you do. You're an incredible organizer. You're sharp and people don't always take you seriously. But at the moment, you feel very lonely. You, don't, you feel like you're all alone in your own house. And God's going to change all of that. He is fast, busy working on your behalf. Amen. Tonight is a turnaround time for you. And you are here tonight because you are praying for your companion, your husband. That's why you're here. And I hear the Lord saying that He's changing his life, not tomorrow, tonight. He's intervening in his life. Now, this is a turnaround time for you as well. And you're sitting in a situation right now where you feel you're in a corner with your work situation. And you don't know how to get out of it and what to do. I see God's rescuing hand coming in and rescuing you out of that. What you're doing right now is not what you're going to do forever. I see you being employed by a company. I see uh, someone that's above you in the medical field employing you and you're working under them. They're going to take all the responsibility and it's going to be a blessing to you. All right. So the lady with the glasses and long hair and a kind of a beigey jacket. Yeah, you know I'm looking at you. No, I'm going to pick you. You knew I was going to pick you. Come on, what's your name? The one lady next to the blue, next to, yeah. The beige. What's your name? April. April, right there in the month of October. How about that? And are you married, Miss April? And uh, how old are you, if you may ask? 29. Okay, what do you do? at a college and a good one you are. Are you in this church? You like it here? Because God's got a real plan for you in this house. Now you have to leave behind you what's behind you, pressing on towards the goal. Because you're carrying a lot of disappointment, frustration, and things that have happened to you which wasn't right. Uh, some of you owned bad decisions, some just wasn't your fault. And you kind of built this neat little safety wall around yourself. And the Lord has a hard time doing stuff for you because you've got it under control. And He wants to take full control. But God has got a plan for you. You asked a friend of yours because you had this relationship difficulty and you asked, what's wrong with me? And the Lord says, I must tell you, He heard you. And there is nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. You've got to pick the right guy. You keep ending up with the same bad boy. What's wrong with you? Pick the right guy. May God change your attraction to the, what you always thought was, eh, that's not my type. Yes, it is. <laughs> Someone that will love you and be nice to you because you are an amazing woman with mega talents. I mean, there's nothing you can't do. There is nothing you can't do. And you've got the DNA of God inside of you from a baby. You were raised, someone prayed over you, someone guided you, someone to help push you in that direction and always believed God for you to be who you are. There's no escape for you, you belong to the Lord. And you are, you come even to the office where you work, where you, live, where you work, people feel it when you walk in that door. You make a difference to the atmosphere. Everybody loves you. And they, they, they come and talk to you and tell you things you didn't want to hear, didn't want to know, because you have something inside of you that God anointed. You are remarkable. So lose those, and I want to say politely, those idiots that you keep hanging out with, lose them. They, they, you are so much better than them. Do you understand? You are, you, you are really an amazing lady. And God's got someone really kind and gentle for you that's going to love you and be good to you, which you really deserve. Yes? Amen. Amen. Uh, April, the real gift that you have is your joy. And that is what is under attack right now. It is your joy that changes the atmosphere in the room completely. And God has given it to you as a, as a key to open every door in your life. Now, I see something that you have studied earlier in your life and you didn't finish it. And I sense that the time is going to come where you're going to study again and God's going to give you the grace to finish it this time and it will play a vital role in your future. There's a promotion that's coming, but you will need that qualification for that issue. Your turn to pick. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, sir, right there in the corner with the hat on, uh, hat, on. hat behind it. Yes. What's your name? Uh, Brian. Brian, the next two is your? 
Reagan, Brian and Reagan. What do you do um, for a living? Sales manager. And you, ma'am? You stay at home. What did you do before you stayed at home? What work did you do? You, you worked at the church before that. Okay. And how many, uh, how many children do you have? Five children. Okay. <laughs> Amen. I see God's, God's hand right now in this season of your life. How God's hand is reaching in. And there's a new level that God is taking your entire family, both of you and your children too, at this moment. And it's going to be the grace and the power of God. Now, hear the Lord saying that in this season, you will get to know His power and His grace like never before. There's a, you're standing at a wall right now and it's only God that can take you through this and take you where you need to be. There's a lot of opposition at the moment, both of you, a lot of people that are standing against you. And I see something, I don't want to say demonic, but some form of spirit that's trying to block you, limit you. And God is dealing with that and moving that completely out of the way so that you as a family can move forward and move on. God's hand is upon your children now, and God's giving you a promise tonight to never be concerned about them. I see specifically their safety, their protection. They're being protected, especially the little one, the youngest one. The protection of God is upon that child. And Lord is saying He's protecting you for the journey where He's taking you. Hallelujah. Five children. I forgot what you said you do, sir. But you're going to have your own business. That's God's destiny for you. And the difficulty is you're very hard to work for yourself. You're not a perfectionist, but you drive yourself. You can't even clean the garage without going to the extremes. You don't take forever to get you to do it. But once you start, it's an extreme thing. And that's what you, everything you do is one side or the other. It's never one in the middle. You don't, and so you've got to learn to pace yourself. You have a wonderful heart. You really do. You're a loyal friend. And you, it was a good day when you were born. It was a really good day when you were born. You put a lot of life and blessing to a lot of people. Uh, you've had to compete in your own family growing up with others that seem to achieve and get all the attention, but you were always God's marked one. He marked you. That's my boy. That's my boy. He was always proud of you because your heart was so amazingly gold. And you will be a father to many children that are not yours spiritually. You'll be a real dad. They will, they will gravitate towards you like flies to a light because you have that instinctive father communication and caring and you make people feel very special and important. It's who you are. You're going to have a business and you're going to build a, yourself and finance yourself a place, a retreat, some sort of camp where kids can go. You, you have such a vision for stuff like that. Your kids are not quiet. You do not have a quiet bunch of kids, unfortunately or fortunately. Uh, one is super intelligent and always business-like, but the rest are very, very active and always up to something. And, and it can, uh, if it's quiet, you must go and look what's wrong because something's happening if it's too quiet. But you are a wonderful family and God's your provider and He will prosper you because He wants to equip you to do the work that you so readily will do. You're not materialistic. You will not hoard stuff for yourself. Although you like boys and toys, you like your fast boats and everything else and all of that will come in the right time. God will let you have it all. That's God's promise to you. Yes, sir. All right. Love to meet you. Meet you both. Am I, have I got time still? Did you have someone else? The teenagers in here. Okay. There's a lot of hands moving around here. How about you help pick? Can you come stand here, please, Pastor, if you don't mind, and, and pick? One of these days, you'll have teenagers. All the teenagers stand up. All the teenagers? Yeah, I just want to see them real quick. I can't see the oh. oh. Can you just pick three, please? Just three. I'm going to do Maya. Let's and I don't know all their names. Riley? Is it Riley? Yeah. Levi, Levi I'm sorry. Levi. You were close. It's in the ballpark. <laughs> and then, um, Matt, pick one for me. Okay, the rest are down, please, so, to, so I can just see who I'm speaking to. What's your name, sweetie? Maya. Maya, like the little bee? Maya the little bee? You know, you know that cartoon? No, you never saw that? I'm old, okay. I have grandkids. How old are you, Maya? And what do you want to do with your life? 
You have, a, you have an all-round spirit. There's not one specific thing that you gifted it, but everything you do. You're an all-rounder, and there's no question that if you will stay faithful to the Lord, you'll marry someone in the ministry or going to the ministry. It's who you are. You have a shepherd's heart. You care about people, and you, you're not a panicked person. And what I love that about you, you don't react, and you very calm and you just uh, take things in your stride. You just don't get one extreme or the other and uh, just make everyone feel comfortable and just, you're just an all-round very sweet lady in so many ways. You're a blessing. And uh, you need to know that your true friends are only coming in your life as you get older. When you're younger, you didn't meet all the ones that God had assigned for your life. That'll be the rest of your life. And God's assigning them for you because you have good things. Definitely, in my, I see in the Spirit how you marry a, a pastor. There's no question in my mind. Amen. Uh, Maya, I see a fear that you have. And God is dealing with any form of fear in your life at this moment. There's a shyness that you have. But like I hear the Lord saying, get, get ready to be in front. Get ready for the spotlight that will be upon your life. Okay, bless you. Is it Levi, the orange shirt fellow? All right, Levi. And uh, how old are you, sir? Twelve. And what, what do you want to do with your life? Do you know? No idea what's dad do. He's a one? Like an IT, okay, okay, all right. Because you have a very practical business guy mind. You, so you might like all the computer industry and IT, but really you're a business person. And you like nice things and you've always got some deal going on in the back of your head and, and you, a plan. And when you get the taste of business, it's going to fuel that in you because you're a businessman. And you will negotiate and you not, won't be the easiest person to deal, deal with because you just don't, you just don't give in. You, you're consistent about those things. You're also a very loyal friend, very good friend to have. Your word is true and uh, you don't mingle the, as much as other kids do, but you're very committed to the friend, relationships and friendships you have now. So you're a good friend to have. And uh, you're on your track, on track to grow and become a fruitful man of God in every way. And uh, as I said, you're really practical businessman. Amen. I see a year ago uh, that you tried to do something and it was your heart to do it, but you were disqualified because uh, there was reasons, physic physicality, you couldn't do it. You couldn't get it right. They disqualified you. I hear the Lord saying tonight that God's saying that He is qualifying you. And those, everyone that has said that you could not do it, they will stand amazed in what you're going to achieve in your life because everything that you put your heart and your faith into, God will make a way for you and open. I see a record that you will break in a natural. They will say it's impossible. You don't, you, you, you don't have what it takes, but God's going to, through you, God's going to show them what He can do and for His kingdom. You're definitely going to speak. I see the word of the Lord upon your lips and how God's going to use your life and your words to be a great testimony to others, encouragement to those that don't have the capacity or the, the, the resources for that. God's definitely touching your family, your dad. He's working in his life right now and he's touching him at this moment. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Go to the next one. I, when I walked into this room tonight, I, I saw you. And I saw a very strong and... What's your name? Mikey. As when I walked into the room tonight, I saw a very strong angelic presence around you. And God's busy working your life the last couple of weeks. I see the intensity of the anointing and... And uh, I want to say a spirit of the sermon starting to increase more and more in your life. Now, God has called you for His kingdom, not for anything else. I see the world has been trying to pull you in different directions. And I'm here tonight to say to you, not now and not in the future, will you be for sale for the world. You are assigned for God's kingdom and He's going to position you and use you to be effective in His kingdom. Now, for a season, a lot of young <laughs> people have jumped with you in the fire. But I hear the Lord saying that you will lead them into the glory and not into anything else anymore. I always clap for you. I always clap for you. I'm not sure why you always clap for him. I don't understand that. <laughs> So, Mikey, I want to ask you two things. I want you to, first of all, I need you to decide today that you're going to pick your friends carefully. The Bible says bad company will corrupt a good character. And from here in your life, you, you kind of everybody's buddy. And you've got to start choosing more wisely the company you keep. It's going to determine a lot in your life. Do you understand? The second thing I want to tell you, education is not your enemy, it's your friend. 
You have this allergy to education, but I'm here to tell you that you are brilliant and smart and you need to study. You need to. It's going to do you good. Do you want to? You've got all kinds of other plans? No. You need to go to school and study. Yep, got it. Thank you. Look at that. Must be family of his. Did you have someone in mind, Pastor? Yeah. Jeff and, your, and Jeff's wife. Hi, Jeff. What's your name, ma'am? Autumn? Okay. I did? Wonderful. Thank you, Autumn. You're a blessing. You're a, you're a very steady little lady and you're a dreamer. The word of the Lord comes to you in dreams. He speaks to you. I need you to pay a little more attention to your dreams because they really are prophetic. They never for you. The pattern in your life is the person that, you, because you're very attentive and very sensitive, and you will, you'll pick up an atmosphere and not know why you're upset. But why am I, why am I so irritated? Why? It's because your spirit is picking up things around you. are very sensitive spiritually. And when you go to sleep and you carry the lamentation says, from many concerns spills over into our dreams. The lamentation says that. And so you'll be concerned for someone and it'll come to you in a dream. God will speak to you about that situation. So in the next morning, you've got the dream, write it down and try and remember, recall what was in your heart and you, it'll, it'll guide you because you have a wonderful gift to, to deal with those things because you're always trying to puzzle them. You overanalyze, you over get after stuff and you need to take it down a notch there and not get so stressed. But you are an amazing woman of God. And so, so what do you do? We have a media company. A media company. Media company. Wonderful. I'm grateful for who you are because you're the real deal. And people don't just don't, don't recognize you, don't honor you, but you are above average by far on every level. From the character of a man to the giftedness of a ministry to the commitment, your word is true. You'll do what you say. And because you don't sell yourself and because you don't push a personality, they don't always take you seriously. But after, the, after quoting and after all those different uh, quotes, then they always end up coming back to you because you, they, you get the work done. You do it right. And they, some guys regret not going with you in the first place because you really are good at what you do. You really, really are. You're a God-given talent. You are. Even growing up, no matter how hard you tried, somebody else got all the celebration. But the Lord is always celebrating you because you're a gift and you are a wonderful couple. You're an asset to God's kingdom, but you're like a secret service. No one has to know because you're doing such things. And because you do it in secret, God rewards you openly. Great wealth is waiting for you in your future because of it. God's going to equip it because he trusts you. You've proven to the Lord that you're his. You'll do whatever he says. You're integrous. You're not visible. No one knows who you are, but the heavenlies know you. You are known in the heavens. You're in, how many kids do you have? Two kids. And what are their names? Isaac and? Please don't take Isaac up any mountain with a knife in your hand. <laughs> just saying, just saying. How old is Isaac? Ten. Isaac's always got some deal going on. He's always trying to go, negotiate with you. He's got a big talker and he's got plans always and he's never satisfied and, and he wants to, he's trying very hard always to get his way. He's always got some scheme going on. Got a good heart and uh, uh, he's just got a lot of things he likes, you know. He's an interesting personality in more ways than one. And, that, and the girl, it's a girl, you said the other one's a little girl? What's her name? Ella. She's two years old. There was a big gap from the one to the other. Uh, Ella is a very strong, uh, very, very smart child, very mathematical and has medicine waiting for her. Not nurse, but a doctor. So that's pretty amazing. You have doctors in your bloodline. Somewhere there's people that are, have been, always been good in that industry. And so it's, good. it's like a visitation. That, that child is super smart. You will see super smart, unnaturally smart. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. One of you, one of you, both of you. <laughs> okay, go. Uh, Jeff, you are just as much called as everyone else is called. And I see how excited you get when God blesses other people and works in their lives. But God says He's about to move in your life. This is your moment and your season. Now, for a long time, you've borrowed from other people. You've asked for favors from other people. But Lord's saying that He's turning it around that in the corporate world, the day will come where they ask you for favors. And God's saying that you will be a big player. I saw that wealth that Prophet Ed spoke about, great wealth. Is God, God's preparing for, for the future and you will be a big, I hear the Lord, he says, 
Jeff, take the lead. Take the lead. There's nothing small about you or about your future. Hallelujah. What is your name back behind the blue shirt? Yes, sir. Matt, and this is your? Your girlfriend, Lisa. Hello, girlfriend, Lisa. Do you come to this church, Lisa? Do you come to this church? You like it here? Do you come here often too? Both of you come to this church? That's pretty cool. Keep it in the house. Keep it in the family, right? So, you guys planning on getting more serious? Just asking? <laughs> because you look very good together to me. So I'm asking, I feel a lot of peace in my heart about it. So I'm not trying to just make a joke. I really feel that the Lord has got something good for you guys. You look very good together, but you've got to shake off, especially you, my sister, where you've been. You've had a disappointment and you're just afraid. Shake it off, girl. God's got you. You're not going to make a mistake. He is what he says he is. He's just the worst communicator. He doesn't tell you how he really feels. And <clears throat> but he's, he, watch his body language. Everything he says is true. He's not going to lie like you've had before. You've had liars. My Lord, you've had liars. They did one thing and did another, and you, you knew it, but you couldn't prove it until the end. He's not that way. It's just not his, it's not his nature. He's just, just not like that. And he doesn't communicate, but he's going to do what he says. And when he says it, he's going to do it. He's a good man, and he'll do what's right. So you need to leave behind what's behind in your life because you kind of have some grieving of what should have, would have, could have been financially, business-like, you feel frustrated because you're a perfectionist. That's the other thing you might have to watch out for. It's going to get on your nerves because that thing has to be exactly, you can't even park. Have you watched him park yet? Hey, you'll, you'll take, it has to be exactly, exactly. It's like, okay, you got it. Now, don't do that. It's okay but, because he's a perfectionist. But everything he'll do he'll, for you, he'll do the same way. And so you have to just be gracious to him with that. He's not going to change that in him. And he watch you, what, we'll see when you put his toothbrush down, he just, how he shakes that thing out. He's got such little methods about him. Everything's got a method with him because that's his nature. But I really feel good about the two of you being together. I feel that really my spirit gets excited. I just want to tell you. Go. And uh, sir, the real gift that you have in your life is to work with finances. I see God's, this is the area that God's preparing for you, not just for yourself, but also to help other people. You're very faithful in how you handle money and how you work with it. But not just that, you have a sensitivity to what the market is doing. And I hear the Lord saying that He's giving you spiritual insight in the marketing. Now God is increasing your, the spiritual side, bringing balance in your life and the natural in the spirit. And I do want to encourage you, I see a greater involvement in the church. I want to encourage you to be here, to be faithful, to be committed, to a church because it's God's busy bringing that balance out in your life and you, you're going to see how your, your spiritual life is going to affect everything else that you're doing out there. The area or arena that you're walking into, you cannot walk into it only with natural wisdom. You will need the spirit in that place. Okay. Next to who with the jacket on? Amber. Did I speak to you before, Amber? No. So no Amber alert. Okay. Are you in this church, Amber? Uh, I'm glad that you're here. The Lord says, wants me to tell you that He's hardworking in your family. You can, you, can, you can be at peace now. God's not going to let the enemy triumph over your loved ones. As sure as my name is Etrat, the devil is not going to win. God's got you. Nobody in this room knows what you've been going through and what you're having to put up with, what you're carrying right now as you sit there. But the Lord, the Lord has got you. He loves you. You asked what you did wrong. Why is this all happening? Nothing. You did nothing wrong. The devil's come to steal and divide and destroy. You did nothing wrong. When you walk out here, you're walking tall because a huge angel next to you has been there for years. You just didn't see it. But a huge angel walks with you. God's going to help you because you lost, you've been losing courage and hope. You're, just, you're tired. You're tired of the fight. You're tired of the struggle. You told them, that was your words to the Lord. I'm tired, Lord. I'm tired. And God says, I got you. I got you. I'm holding you. You're my girl. I'm watching out for you. You're safe. You will, the devil will not triumph. So be full of, full, of, full of joy when you go home. God is with you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I say two things that God is doing. He's touching you physically, your body tonight. Physical, physical healing taking place right now. And number two, restoring your sleep. You will sleep tonight like never before. Hallelujah. Uh, this, this is a, one of the most amazing churches in, I've been to in my life. And 
Uh, there's a lot of maturity and wisdom in the house, uh, but there is a fresh wave coming that will, God wants to. He's been preparing you for years for what He wants to do. The, ch- the name of this church is Church for All Nations, to be a voice and a light. And today, we've, COVID has shown us how small the world is uh, just through the media, how quick we, we communicate and how advanced it's become. But this church is definitely going to a new level on a whole new way. And so I want to warn you, be prepared for something you didn't expect because God always does something new. We want a revival, but God's ways are so different. Reviving the old ways, not the way God does it, the new way. And so something new is going to happen. I need you to be open and prepared because it's going to be so exciting and something you've not seen before. Seven last words of a dying church has usually been, it has never been this way before. And God is doing something so brand new and God's been preparing you for years. They are wonderful. You have the highest level of mature quality people I've ever seen in one, one, in one church. It's like there's just no babies here. Everyone's full of fire and full of glory. It's just amazing to me. It's quite uh, uh, impressive to my soul because I'm used to all different levels of maturity. But you guys are so advanced in your Christendom and your love for God. I appreciate that so much. Thank you for the wonderful privilege of being here tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. 